Hey everyone, so it is Tom here with a slightly different episode than we usually have. Uh, as many of you know, we recently went to the museum in Wales to see the Jesse Knight collection and we recorded a couple of extra interviews while we were there that we're going to be releasing over the next while. So first up, we have Matt's conversation with Lisa Childs, who is the Senior Archive and Photographic Conservator at the muse at the National Museum in Wales. So, I uh, hope you enjoy the conversation and talk to you soon. I guess, like first of all, introduce yourself. Like, who are you? It just feels like a dating show. <laughs> who are you? What do you do, contestant number two? Uh, I am Lisa Childs, and I am the Senior Archive and Photographic Conservator at Angathka Cymru. Amazing, and you have been working on conserving, preserving. The Jesse Knight collection, right? I have, yes. So I remember when uh, I first met you, we were at Neil's house and I was trying to convince the National Museum to acquire the collection. And I was really worried that you were going to put a kibosh on it because you looked... <laughs> oh, te- really? Well, because you looked, you looked so, um, panic so panicked and terrified in a good way. <laughs> so I don't know if you can talk about that. Like the, the first time we, we pulled those plastic bags and ice cream crates and stuff out um, and, and started going through the collection, like what your experiences of that were. I, I do remember being terrified. It's true. There's also, um, I wasn't, I, I wasn't aware of the fact that um, I think I just thought that I was meeting you and just having a general <laughs> look. And then I'm sort of like told, oh, there you go. Can you just sort of assess it? I'm like, Oh my yeah. God, there's boxes there's and a lot boxes of and boxes and bags. Yeah. And, um, as I was sort of like unpacking things. And I think one of the first things I saw were the uh, works that were covered in sticky back plastic. Yeah. And I just thought, oh God, this isn't good. This isn't <laughs> <enough."> <laughs> so yeah, I was a bit panic stricken. Also the sheer size of it. Yeah. And I had, and I knew that in the two hours that I'd been there, I'd only seen a fraction yeah. of it. And basically I was being asked to you know, give my opinion on whether it was a good thing for us <laughs> to have it. And I, from a conservation point of view, I'm not sure, sure but yeah. you know, obviously, it was something that we needed to to have. So, um, so, yeah. so, what kind of stuff has been your your bread and butter? So, what kind of material are you you usually looking after or or, or dealing with? Uh, here at the museum, uh, it could be all sorts of things. We have collections right the way across the museum, and I'm responsible for anything that's basically paper based and archival. We have yeah. a conservator who deals with the works of art on paper. So that could be uh, Siemens identity cards, maps. Um, I'm working on at the moment, well, I'm going to be working on, I'm very excited about a uh, police, policeman's little notebook. Oh, you know, wow. They kept in their top pocket from, the, from 1904. So wow. it's, it's incidents of, you know, horses going running wild through villages and stuff <laughs> like that. So anything really like you the photographs as well massive collections of photographs we have across the museum we've got um uh designer sketches from uh, a, a new knitwear collection that's coming um wow. black lives matters placards there's something else that i've been working on recently creating storage um boxes which enable them to not lie against each other yeah. you know but they're easily accessible that's one of the main things we're always having to consider now is not only how to keep them safe but they need to be readily accessible yeah so it's like designing storage packaging for them as well so so what's the job of a conservator then like what what is what do you have to do basically when, when an object comes into the museum what's the when they come into the museum what i'll do is i will physically examine them make a record as well. We keep digital records, take photographs of them on arrival. And we work in conjunction with the curatorial staff. They tell us, they show us what they want, um, why they want it, why it's of value. I tell them what uh, needs to be done (laughs) (laughs) in order to make it accessible long term. So yeah, I'll, I'll make a record, I'll list and photograph any damage, the condition that it's in. And I'll make a recommendation of what needs to be done to it as well, yeah. in order for it to be safely handled and displayed. And you're not you're not restoring things, are you? Really, you're not putting things back to you know what they would have been like the day they were made. You're you're, no. you're trying to, well, how would you how would how would you describe? I'd say preserve it as best you can without removing, because for example, with the the tattoo collection, we have other things as well. Um, one of the 
uh, items I've been working on or off recently is a Welsh Bible, but it was used underground. Wow. Yeah, they built a chapel in their, in their colliery and they, the, they used to take it in turns to preach. Um, so it was, it's, it's absolutely filthy because <laughs> they were filthy. The environment was filthy. Yeah. It would have been stored down there. So it's fallen apart. It's particularly dirty where they've been turning the pages. But you, the assessment is that we would stabilize that. We'd, we'd, we'd make sure that any loose pages were uh, better attached yeah. so that they didn't become separated from the binding. Um, but its intrinsic value is the fact that it is um, covered in coal dust because yeah. it was used underground. So I wouldn't clean it. What I will do is I will then create a, a, a custom-made packaging system which will incorporate materials, which we have a material called microchamber, which has um, sort of like inbuilt absorbance in it, and it will absorb any of the acids being off-gassed from it. So it will still be as it is, but the hope is that it won't get any it worse. It won't get any worse. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that, that's a nice segue then to talk about about the Jesse collection. So, you know, even from my non-expert eye, I can see in there, you know, everything from proper sketch paper to cardboard boxes, wallpaper, um, random bits of tissue paper. Like, what's what what kind of things have you been dealing with already? What challenges have you faced? And uh, and are there things you're putting off because you think I'm going to leave that because that's too difficult? <laughs> well, ultimately, the the baseline materials that she used, like the board, the art board, and the paper, are really good quality. Yeah. What isn't is what she's used to ironically to repair things and to extend yeah. their useful lives so sort of like sticky tape the and... sticky but the sticky tape the sticky back plastic um she also used um fablon which is a get is, is a type of sticky back plastic but it was the the color type that they used in the 60s to sort of like decorate their kitchens yeah things. um so she was using these things to help extend the life of the tattoos and, and ironically those are the things that are causing the most damage oh, that's really interesting yeah and and lots of it is um, very nicotine stained. Yeah, well, I, I would say to uh, to my colleague earlier. Normally, when you're cleaning things, you can smell what it is, <laughs> but I can't smell nicotine. Oh, I'm presuming that that it it must be to an extent, but there is no overt nicotine yeah, smell. Yeah, that's so, really interesting. But they are extremely dirty. Yeah, yeah. and and you've started to clean. Yes. Some pieces. How's that been going? It's going really well. It's really <laughs> satisfying because I mean, we've, we've got some that are very early. We're talking like early 20th century. Yeah. And those are more problematic because the dirt is really ingrained. Yeah. And so. And presumably the, the paper stock on those are a bit, is a bit more fragile. And... Yeah. We're sort of working around those at the moment. We, we have a slightly different cleaning technique for the actual uh, tattoo flashes that have been stuck onto the, the backing yeah. support because. We don't like using, we use sort of like soft erasers, but we don't like using that directly onto pigments Yeah. because not only are the risk of um, dislodging them, but also it just changes the color tone. Yeah. And you're also inputting, because rubbers always to a degree have some sort of plasticizer in them. Yeah. And you can use the safest one that you can, but there's still an element of you may leave a deposit. So Interesting. yeah, we don't want to do that as much as possible. So we try and work around the pigment as much as we can and, and and yeah so what's been happening with the cleaning so on some of those later ones you you said to me earlier on you've started to see a real difference in oh yeah definitely yeah because the the later ones they are extremely dirty but what's really was really the thing that i was worried about was because like with the welsh bible the thing that's of of, of importance to me is that they retain yeah. their history their usage and the fact that they look as if they've been passed around a, a tattoo yeah. studio or taken off a wall is what makes them interesting. Otherwise, yeah. they're just somebody's drawings on a board. And I was worried about how I would be able to clean them, take off the surface dirt that was um, sort of spoiling the aesthetic of the work, yeah. as well as introducing something that could cause long-term damage, but still retain all that 
those handling marks. But I think because it's basically it's it's like greasy fingers and yeah. sweaty fingers, <laughs> that's staying. That's not going anywhere. You can't remove that. Yeah, it's so, lots of tattooers have quite greasy fingers. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you were saying that a lot of them, uh, and something that I'd noticed as well, are missing corners or yes. they've got pinholes they've been pinned on the wall or been removed or yeah. as you, you know probably presumably when they're held in the corners that's where the degradation is happening yeah. a lot of the sheets are missing or have tears in the corners right yeah yeah that's always the the, the weak spot really yeah um but that's again that's another you know as i asked you earlier is would she have taken them off the yeah. wall and put them back on again so they do have multiple drawing pinholes they do have that wear and tear and with something like that you're sort of you're trying to find the balance of um, when I first started doing conservation, if I'd looked at that 30 years ago, we probably would have infilled the corner yeah. where it was missing. Now we don't do that. What we'll yeah. do is we'll we'll preserve what's left and um, I'll do some consolidation work so that any loose pieces are reattached yeah. back to where they should have been. Maybe if the board is split, I'll re-adhere the board together. But I wouldn't in I wouldn't build up that yeah. corner anymore. Because yeah. that's that's not what it is now, yeah. and and it's it's like that for a reason. And I think as as well as being you know works of art, uh, beautiful pieces of visual, aesthetically interesting uh, drawing, they are t- they were tools. You know, they oh. were they were used to make money. They were used um, to, to to get customers through the door, to be able to work as quickly as possible, to stand out from the crowd. And yeah, they they they're, they're tools as well as beautiful works of art. And I think it's really. Um, yeah, it's really uh, good to, to hear you say that, that you understand how that's going. I mean, so I don't know how much you knew about tattooing before this came here, before this collection came here. And you and I have talked a lot today already about some of the details about material. But I wonder, like, yeah, what you've learned about tattooing just from playing probably more closely with such a large collection of Tattoo Flash than probably anyone. I think there there are other collections of tattoo history material at uh, major museums, one in Hamburg in particular, but I don't think even there they've done as um, in, intimate, intricate curation um, conservation as you've begun to do. So you're probably you probably know more about the material of tattoo history, given the range of this collection. You know, it's probably about seventy or eighty years worth of material. Uh, given your expertise about paper, like you probably know more about tattoo flash now than like you know from a from a um, technical point of view, than probably anyone ever. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm not. I think I feel I'm barely scratching the surface. Yeah. To be honest, I really do because I mean, it, you know, we we were aware and we were looking through the tattoo collection. There were certainly things that hadn't been drawn by Jesse Knight. Yeah. But it wasn't until you were talking us through it that we realised what a range of artists we have in that collection, and. I really didn't know very much about it at all. You know, I mean, obviously, I've got a tattoo. Most people that I know have got a tattoo. Um, I remember my father nearly got arrested at Heathrow Airport once, and the only reason he didn't get arrested was the man they were looking for had a tattoo. Oh, wow. And he didn't, yeah, because the de- all the details were the same apart from this tattoo. Um, and in fact, I grew up with uh, my my family had a very negative ta- negative view yeah. of tattoos, you know. Tom's mum said my tattoos were awful when she saw them in a photograph really? the other day, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so, I, you know, I didn't read, and I don't think, uh, you you hear all the stories about, like, you know, Winston Churchill's mother had a tattoo, yeah. or, you know, the urban myth type of stuff. You don't know whether it's true or not. But the more you look into it, the more you you know that there is to discover. Yeah. You know, I not, I didn't realise that, um, sounds really stupid to somebody like you, but like the tattoos of um, uh, someone from the Far East. Yeah. I thought it was just because they liked that imagery. Not that it necessarily meant that they had sailed yeah. in that part of the world or they'd been in the China Sea. Sometimes, like yeah. Some, certainly in some specific contexts, you, could, you can trace like, yeah, X means Y designs and i think you know what's so great about the collection is it does span this period really like when tattooing around about 1900 when some of the earliest things in the collection are from um that is a time when tattooing is still pretty pretty classy in a way it's starting to change the upper classes are starting to lose interest a little bit but you know those very intricate uh like watercolors beautiful watercolors absolutely absolutely like 
perfect miniatures. Those are, yeah, and particularly the work that was, um, uh, you know, we've, uh, thanks to the work of Terry Mountain, I've identified as the work of Albert Gordon. There's beautiful watercolours are, are, in, are an indication of the kind of, you know, the attitude towards the thing. And then by the time we get to the 1940s and 50s, when Jesse's buying production sheets from places like Chicago Tattoo House to Tattoo Supply House or Sporting and Rogers, colouring them in, it's much quicker. It's much more, you know, it's much um, it's much less a, um, you know, it's much it's much less an artistic in that kind of vernacular sense craft than, than just a kind of, you know, getting as many tattoos done in a day <laughs> um, and bashing them out. And I think you can... You can see that I'm sure in in the in the techniques and in the materials and in the kind of design decisions that are being made, right? Mm. She said it's it's interesting actually. You can see in her tattoos what you're saying yeah. about the speed of it. Like the the earlier ones, they're so finely detailed, yeah. and you can actually imagine them pouring over them to get yeah. that fine detail. But hers look like she's in a hurry. Yeah, a lot of the time. Some of them you can see that she's actually taken her time. Got to get down the pod before like, closing, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I love those signs that she put up everywhere, telling the people to behave themselves. Yeah, all in blank Watch verse. Watch their language. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, do you feel do you feel like you've got to know her a little bit from from looking at the stuff she drew and the stuff she owned and the stuff that she had around her? Like, yeah, and but also, also looking at the photographs. Actually, yeah, really, the, it's the great. photographs. Yeah, of her in her studio. And uh, <laughs> always having a laugh. It sounds, by the yeah, of it. but it sounds really daft. But one day I was looking at a couple of them because I wanted to see what was in the background. And I thought, oh, God, you've got a really messy looking workspace, mm. just like me. <laughs> and I know where stuff is and I know why I put it there. But to yeah. the people walking into my room, like, oh, God, Lisa, you need to tidy up this space. <laughs> and I thought, wow, she works like I do. And that's why I was asking yeah. you what the workshop was like, you yeah. know? Because I, that sort of thing is is intriguing to me because I like to know how people work. You know? And I think, I mean, even things like something that I don't know, you're obviously not, I don't know if you are conserving it, but one of the things that really excited me about the collection as a whole is the dirty towel that's covered in ink where she's just wiping things down. Yeah. <laughs> Horrifying to like modern uh, hygienic eyes, but an indication of how she's working, right? Yeah. She's kind of quick and she's cleaning and... And changing things around. I just yeah. think that's brilliant. Well, it's like the Welsh Bible. It's other, If it hasn't got that on it, it's just yeah. a tea towel. Exactly. It's, just a yeah. cloth. it's nothing. You yeah. know, it, it needs it needs that context and that history behind it to yeah. make, it, make it something interesting. So what, what challenges have you faced with the material? Because so, I was asking you about the, the, the plastic. You mentioned mm. that a minute ago. And we've talked a lot today when we've been talking before we recorded about that. So, yeah, talk us through the... Talk us through the sticky back plastic. Yeah, the sticky back plastic was something that I'd never worked with before. We work with, uh, you know, we have problems with sellotape quite often with archives. People yeah. tape up stuff. I, I'm bad at doing that myself. <laughs> um, but sticky back plastic, no, I'd never worked with before. And there are swathes of it as well. And I really didn't know what to do with it because plastic doesn't really come into archive conservation no. world, you know. So I tried... Googling to see who was who was dealing with plastics conservation. Um, and this happened in the middle of COVID. So I was contacting as a plastics conservator at the VNA, for example. They weren't responding. I tried the Maritime Museum, they weren't responding. I tried somebody else. They said, Yeah, we'll get back to you. And of course they didn't. Yeah. Um and then I think one thing, because I I went to a course years ago at Westin College, which is in yeah. uh you probably know it, yeah. yeah. It's in it's Sussex, isn't it? By Sussex. Right. And um, so they send me their course lists because that's that's one of the one of the places where you can still study good old school conservation techniques yes, in the UK. It in is. West Dean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic place. And conservation of plastics came up. Oh, oh my god! And it was um, it was a four day course. And I co- I said to my line manager, I need to go on this because I I don't know what to do with this. That the the problem with the sticky back plastic is that. It was leaching the plasticizer, so it was sticky, which meant that yeah. these it was predominantly used on scrolls. She had like this ten foot, as you know. Yeah, which like people. I, I think scrolls. I think that probably is, was material that she may have taken out to tattoo, yeah. like people if they were coming off boats, maybe. And it seems like that's a likely reason for her assembling those. Yeah. But it it doesn't. I mean, it's probably not the only. Re- I, I I hesitate to say that that's probably not the only reason that things coming out of tattoo shops are sticky. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> not to put you but they have, they have a they they have a horrible um, acrid 
smell Do as well. And also, it what worried me because, of course, I was handling them first. Right. And um, and then I did this course, and I found out that these plasticizers are not nice. They're they're they're, they're phthalates. They're yeah. the early ones in particular. They they're not good. But I found out just by chance. We we'd um, one of the scrolls came into our collection. And I realised that it was dry. That it wasn't. It wasn't sticky anymore. It was dry to the touch. And it was. It would have been done around the same time as these. And yeah. I thought this has got to be because it was on display. So I mentioned this when I went on the course. I didn't want to try it just in case they'd done something that I didn't know. And I spoke to there's a, a plastics conservation expert who uh, works in in the Netherlands, I think now called Yvonne Shashula. And I told her about this, and she said, "No, that's right. You need to off." Off gas them, and um, and then they're quite. It's quite simple to to clean them. Actually, you just like wipe them wipe them over because they'll always retain a small amount of the plasticizer. Oh, they'll carry on off gassing to a degree, but they'll retain enough for it to remain flexible. So that's what we've been doing with these. But also the, the, the plasticizer, the um, sticky back plastic. You can see you you've probably seen it on yeah. yourself. That there are. A gap. She was quite sort of in a hurry by the looks of it when she yeah. applied it. So it's not done neatly by any stretch of the imagination. And and on some of them, there are gaps between one layer of one piece of sticky back plastic and another. And the bit in between, the paper is white, but the paper under the sticky back plastic has gone. Well, it looks yellow, but that's either because the sticky back plastic has gone yellow, or the adhesive has damaged yeah. the paper and and it's it's turning yellow. Wow. So there's. There's not actually very much we can do with that. We can off gas it and we can clean it, but we can't stop it deteriorating. Yeah. So one of the things that we will probably do with that, we're going to look at storage situation where they they stay rolled, but in a much wider roll yeah. because you you can see that once they stay in a tight roll, they they sort of lock in that position, don't they? And then we'll probably freeze them. Yeah, I I could think that's so hilarious. I mean, we're talking about this earlier on. <laughs> These things that have been sitting in. Plastic bags and sports bags in uh, Neil's house for decades, and prior to that, were passed around tattooers with their sticky, ink-stained fingers, and you know, and, and now they're being kept in freezers to yeah. stop them disappearing. I just think that's brilliant and beautiful and exciting. So. Well, the, the fantastic stuff about the fantastic thing about freezers is they basically like keep them in stasis. Yeah. So when they come out, you just give them like twenty-four hours to defrost very, very slowly. Yeah. And then they are as they were when you put them in the freezer. That's amazing. So it's just all we need is like a day's notice. If someone <laughs> wants to see them, and then they're there. Move the available. move the frozen peas out of the yeah. way, and then you can... <laughs> yeah, or the body, whichever. Yeah, or the body. <laughs> well, put it in a museum. So I go maybe just to finish up. I could talk to you all day, but maybe to finish up, I wonder if there's anything that's really surprised you uh, when you've been working very closely with this material. Anything that that has really stood out as yeah, as unexpected. I mean, you've mentioned some things already, but yeah, I think it's the 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 quality of some of the artwork. Yeah, is astonishing. It's yeah. so fine and it's so delicate. It's almost like they weren't thinking of a tattoo; they yeah. were just drawing something because they wanted to create something exactly. beautiful. Yeah, and and how they've lasted as well. I think that's that's the the damage has been caused by their use. They're handling, not by the materials. And that's often a problem in conservation. Oh, interesting. Is that it's, I mean, particularly like 20th century material is awful because people, <laughs> people that, well, really from the industrial age, because before that they used to use cloth, yeah. they used to beat cloth to make paper. But once they started being able to mash up wood, they were making paper from any old rubbish. And so 20th century in particular between the you know the, the wars as well where they weren't able to import stuff um, a lot of the paper is is rubbish so actually these things have been damaged by what's been added to them yeah rather than them their own substance yeah which yeah. is a shame really. and I think I think that that's the thing it's going to be the earlier stuff by artists like George Burchett and um, uh, and Hartley and uh, as I said, Albert Gordon, and I think it, just to just to hear you say that, and as I said, you you have probably been uh, certainly some of your expertise been up close with more tattoo flush than probably any any paper conservator ever, um, and it's really uh, really fascinating to hear you 
talk about that's, the that's material. A little bit, it gives me a, it's, it's very privileged. It makes me feel <laughs> extremely privileged, but at the same time, it's it's a little bit frightening. Terrifying. Because you, yeah, because you have a huge responsibility yeah. to something that rare and special yeah. as well. Yeah, because most any 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 equivalent objects to this are just in people's you know in people who love them and care for them and God bless tattoo collectors and tattoo artists who without this without them none of this would have survived anyway. But they're not professional conservators, you know. And and as I said, they've they've put them in frames in their houses and and that's it. But to actually be thinking about you know some of these things have survived. 100 120 years but we want them to survive for another 120 mm. years i think that's a really um it's a conversation that we haven't had before as a tattoo community and i think it's really interesting to be having them and and those particular challenges of, of things like sticky back plastic and sellotape and um yeah like you know the weird particle board stuff and all of that it it's interesting that and i'm sure with with as you said with plastics conservators in general are going to have to learn how to deal with this stuff and so you're really at the cutting edge of some it's stuff. It's been like, happening in contemporary art yeah. circles for donkey's right. years, really. That people that they but hasn't happened in in the archives world as much. Yeah, you know, the, our main enemy has always been sellotape. So, <laughs> so this is this is a, a new battle, but it's an interesting one. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's it's a joy to work on it. It really is. It's a slightly scary one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I think I could My talk pleasure. to you all day, but Tom's got to edit this down into something that people can listen to. So, um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for answering all our questions as well. See you.